and welcome into a very special midweek episode of Secret Stealth Show of American Reason. That's American Reason, your very own Eastern Iowa political talk radio show. We are broadcasting to you, as always, from 89.7 Carry Y, Iowa City's sound alternative. Vic, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, man. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well, especially considering we are joined in studio today by a very special guest, Dr. Jasser, MD. He is a, uh, I don't know, a speaker, a lecturer. You're going to be speaking tonight at the... Uh, at the, in the IMU here at, uh, uh, so today is October 3rd for our internet audience, so, <laughs> so in a couple hours, so don't get too excited, but it is at 7 p.m. All of our live listening audience should hit us up. Uh, come to the South Room 179 in the IMU. Admission is free, but it's first come, first serve, so don't be here late. Uh, Dr. Jasser is the president and founder of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Thank you for joining us, sir. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Okay, so I recognize you. And uh, I would say I recognize you from, uh, from before they asked us to conduct this interview. And what I remember if you, I'm so, uh, this is, a, you know, the 21st century. Research for this show included, uh, you know, hitting up Wikipedia and YouTube. <laughs> and uh, YouTube, I pretty quickly recognized you from uh, Representative Peter King's hearings, I think just last year. Um, and his hearings were called, if I can find them, The Extent on Radicalization in the Muslim Community and, communities, and that community's response. And uh, we talked about this on the show. It was very big news, and it was very interesting news to us. And most of the people that reported on it in the media, uh, and uh, you know, I think we're pretty center of the road, but uh, most every place that reported on it in the media kind of characterized it as a very uh, McCarthyistic. You know, they, they, thought as a, they saw it as sort of an affront to American Muslims to even have this, uh, have this conference, have this... Uh, this hearing, this dialogue. And uh, I remember uh, thinking, well, it could be McCarthyistic. It could turn out to be that way. But I remember feeling almost embarrassed to uh, be saying on the air, well, what, what if it's not? Like, it's not, I'm, I'm not in the Muslim community. So, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't feel too terrible saying, well, is there something to be worried about? And I thought, this is actually a great opportunity for people from the Muslim community to actually say, listen, this is us. We are not who you think we are. And uh, I was happy to recognize you on C-SPAN 3 on YouTube as one of the people that actually availed themselves to this opportunity to speak to the, the United States as a whole and say, uh, we're not this way. Why do you think that there was such a problem what, that to even ask this question was very offensive to you know, a lot of people, Muslim and non-Muslim alike? Well, that's a great question. And you know, you. You, you hit the nail on the head. It was sort of a a weird phenomena that just evolved in the evolution towards those hearings. The The Homeland Security Committee called me back in November, and the, the hearings happened March 10th. And uh, they were very interested in our work, and they were looking at, well, how can we fix the problem? And uh, I never felt they were attacking Muslims, that they were on any type of quote-unquote witch hunt. They were basically concerned about homeland security. They said, you know, Zudi, listen, we, we see that over the last 228 arrests on terrorism charges, over 180 were Muslims. <laughs> so we are, uh, Muslims are less than 1.5% of the population, but yet 85% of the rest. So somewhere there's an ideological issue. Not that the vast majority of Muslims are that way, but if we're going to fix the problem, Muslims are going to be the ones to lead that effort. So they interviewed me. We had a number of uh, uh, conference calls, uh, presentations, and they said, you know, we'd like you to testify because they felt that our organization is doing this from a position of tough love. I'm raising my kids to be devout uh, um, God-fearing Muslims that love this country, but we realize that this is an internal issue. So my first sentence in my testimony was, I'm saddened by the fact that this has become, the, you know, theatrics, yeah. hysterics, and I see my country divided between two poles. One pole that thinks that there's no Muslim that could ever be honest and that they're all potential terrorists, which is absurd, and the other pole that thinks that no Muslim could ever be a terrorist and that somehow faith has nothing to do with it. And yeah. when, in fact, somewhere in the middle is the majority of Americans that are just sort of pulling out their hair saying, we have this problem, nobody can talk about it, even though our country was founded on values of religious freedom— and we talked about religion all the time at the Founding Fathers. Today, once you bring up religion, people say, oh, my God, you're attacking me. And, you know, a lot of these groups have gotten their 
um, you know, their popularity ought to saying that they're about Muslim civil rights and victimization issues, and nobody wants to get to the substance. And the amazing thing was in the wake of my testimony, yeah. we published not only my oral testimony, but 15 pages of substantive evidence of things we want to do to to improve and reform the Solutions. ideas like, like yes. I'm going to talk about tonight. And not one criticism came substantive. And every criticism I got from people saying, how could you sell us out? And Muslims that were upset, <laughs> we got 10 Muslims that would say, thank you for saying things we wanted to say. Thank you for showing America that there are Muslims that love this country that are part of the solution and not just part of the problem. Right. It's like, uh, it's like there's some problem in people's minds in this country. And, and I don't know if it's the whole West. I think there's some aspect of it throughout the West that you don't want to take people at their word. It's as if they either believe that religion is always completely poisonous or they believe that it's always completely benign. But whatever it is, you can't trust what people actually say. I mean, I've always thought, okay, the Spanish Inquisitors and Doc, Dr. Martin Luther King seem to both have genuinely held religious beliefs. Uh, a certain recently dead you know, monster in Pakistan and... Just last month, 12,000 Muslims who gathered in London, Wembley Stadium, categorically denouncing all violent extremism in the name of Islam. You know, one guy versus 12,000. Like, okay, why not just accept both of them are probably being genuine? Both sides of the American Civil War said they were doing it for God. And I have no reason not to, to believe both sides believed what they're saying. Uh, you know, is there... Oh, I mean, this is probably going to be stepping on your speech tonight, but... <laughs> How, how do you encourage, how, how do you think there is a, a way to encourage a dialogue that acknowledges that sometimes religion is good, sometimes, how, how can we criticize religion without at the same time categorically denouncing all religion? Yeah, I think it's it's the way to, I mean, the most American part of me, why my family loves this country and why we felt we could practice our faith more freely here than anywhere else in the world, is that we felt that this country is, is a meritocracy, it's based on individual rights, and that we don't collectivize people. And yet the response to the Muslim question has been about collectivizing. Either the whole group's bad or the whole group's good. Silly. And there can't be this question of, well, the Islam of most Muslims I know is a very benign, humble, virtuous faith, but there's another Islam out there, which is the Islam of the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia that 15 of the hijackers believed in, the Islam of bin Laden, the Islam of Al-Qaeda, the Islam of Hamas, the Islam of Islamic Jihad, and all these radical groups that in the most conservative estimates is 5% of the population, which if you do the math, is about 80 million Muslims. Yeah. So those numbers are, are very significant, and we need to counter that. And only Muslims can fix that, and I think one of the things we need to do as a community is realize that we're not monolithic, that we are diverse, and also that we need we have a responsibility, that the world is, is suffering in, in, in what I've described frequently as a whack-a-mole program, yeah. <laughs> that we keep you know hitting the terrorists where they come up, and we're not stopping the fuel from below. And that fuel is the idea of supremacism of an Islamic concept that it's better than any other faith and societies that are not based in Islam are inferior and that ultimately they want to uh, uh, spread those ideas oppressively or coercively. Right. And until we address those head on and we, we start talking about the difficult questions within Islam, not about violence, but and look at the administration and Bush and Obama, they called it violent extremism. Right. What is that? I mean, I don't know what that is. I mean, violent extremism it's a could, be, crowd. could be road rage on the road. I mean, I don't <laughs> know what that is. Definitely. I mean, it, it could be anything. So how do you treat something you can't even talk about because of the, you know, the current environment? Yeah. So, so one of the things that, that uh, I think I've seen in, in, in some, of, some, of your, some of your talks is, is a separation of the, and I think this is very much what you're going for, a separation of the religious part and, and of the political part. Uh, so what sort of a level do you see as being appropriate for the, for the, uh, the involvement of religion in, in government? Because religion is definitely a part of you know, the vast majority of the world's you know, life, their daily life. It's something that, that informs their daily views. So what is the extent that we can have that in our government and still have a just and free society? Oh, that is such an important question. And, and the most common criticism I get is that the Islamists that don't want to deal with this issue say, Zudi, what about all the Christian conservative groups that are, and the Jewish groups, etc., that are, uh, use their faith as uh, part of their political movement? And, you know, listen, I'm not saying I'm against the assembly rights of, of Muslim groups to get together. What we're talking about is the Establishment Clause. That is the nugget 
that I'm talking about, the ideas that form the Establishment Clause, which is that freedom you know, of religion, not freedom from religion, okay? So therefore, the government stays out of the business of establishing uh, uh, faith, establishing laws based in a specific faith's legal system. And at the core of that is a method of argumentation. I think a lot of things what Americans take for granted is that when we argue things in America, regardless of what group you're assembling with, at the end of the day, if you believe you want to change a law in the Iowa legislature or in the federal Congress, you have to prove it to America based on the, the merits of your argument. You can't say, well, because it's in Genesis so-and-so, I want to make this law because it's canon law. But in the Islamic world, currently the Islamists shut me up because they say, well, Zudi, you don't have a degree in Sharia law. And you know what? Your argument doesn't matter. So, for example, I don't drink alcohol because according to my faith, I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I would never be for a law against alcohol uh, sold. Uh, because I believe that the way to prevent it is not through the law, but through education and culture, etc. And therefore, if you have Islamic law, that reasoned argument cannot be presented. You look at the book, it says alcohol is outlawed, you must therefore have a law against it. So laws are made by scriptural exegesis and not made by reason. And I think that is the part where the difference is. I'm not against Muslims assembling. Personally, right. I don't agree with it. I think if I go to a mosque, it shouldn't matter if I pray next to a communist, a socialist, a conservative, a Democrat. I want to listen to a sermon about moral issues, about not about if I want to form a pack, I can do that outside the mosque. I don't think the mosque should be used for pack activities. That's my personal. Do I think Muslims can form pack? Sure. If they want to, that's fine. Sure. I don't see the relevance, but that's not what I'm fighting. I'm fighting against the Islamization of government and the, the use of the concept of the Islamic State. Because once you take away, because in the main concept, and this is part of my talk tonight, there's a concept <laughs> called Ummah. Ummah in Arabic is all over the Quran. It means faith community. Well, in our history, the word Ummah also is synonymous with nation. Until we reform that concept, and you say that, you know what, Ummah as nation is done. We don't need that anymore. You're going to continue to have... Uh, uh, supremacist through Islamization. Right. So you mentioned your uh, stance on drinking alcohol, your, your personal stance yeah. on it. And you said you would never be for a law, you know, uh, banning alcohol. Absolutely. But uh, if you knew it was on strictly religious grounds being proposed, would you actively oppose a law? Uh, and what it, what it brings me up to, uh, oh, uh, this segues me to remember uh, a story late last year, Oklahoma uh, passed a, a silly law banning uh, Sharia law. Now, I don't know that there were uh, necessarily any serious attempts to institute <laughs> Sharia law in Oklahoma, but they, they went ahead and, uh, you know, maybe they were thinking about your whack-a-mole strategy. Maybe they thought, we'll take a preemptive step here, and uh, yeah. even though there's not really any reason to, let's go ahead and uh, ban Sharia law. Now, at the time, we made fun of that quite a bit on the show. Uh, and the reason I made fun of it was that, uh, not, not that I think it's a bad idea to ban Sharia law. It's that it's already banned. It's redundant. Like you said, the Establishment Clause clearly bans Sharia law already. This is a, a waste of everybody's time and probably inciting uh, you know, a divide, right? So just winning some votes. But not everybody in the country felt that way. And, uh, and it's, it's worth mentioning, reminding our listeners, that you uh, founded and are president of the American Islamic Forum for, uh, for Democracy, the AIFD. A uh, different organization, CARE, the Council of American Islamic Relations, actually one of their members sued to, uh, to get rid of the Sharia law ban. And that I, okay, I was laughing at the Sharia law ban. That I take a little more seriously because why are you trying to overturn that ban? Like, it, I mean, it's still banned, but why, why do you want to overturn that? That is a uh, council for, you know, the Council of American Islamic Relations. Uh, if you're thinking about you know, not prohibiting Sharia. I mean, one of those two American Islamic, one of those two groups seems more heavily represented there. Yeah. And I, you know, we put out a statement when the Oklahoma law came out and we were supporting the motives behind it, but we did not support the wording of the legislation. Uh, our coalition of not only the American Islamic Forum for Democracy, but uh, o over 15 organizations, up to 20 now, um, signed a support of the Michigan law um, two weeks ago, we put out a press release. Why? Because CARE and others have now said that this Michigan law, which is American law for American courts, which is a much smarter legislation. And the reason it's smarter, it said that, be, and this is why you need the law. You're right in that technically you'd think, well, this is redundant. You have American law. Right. Why do we need a legislation? Well, what happens if you look at England, for example, there are arbitration systems in which because of freedom, which is great, 
people can agree to arbitrate. So they say, you know what, we're going to find this imam who's now going to adjudicate our conflict. We're never going to go to the civilian court and never let the government know about this. We're just going to agree that whatever the imam says, we're going to follow. And therefore, you've created a nation within a nation. There's neighborhoods that become segregated, that now there's over 85 functioning Sharia courts in England, and they've never permitted Sharia courts. The Archbishop of Canterbury is on record as saying he supports those Sharia courts. I think he's living vicariously through the Islamic community. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to prevent. There are some areas in America, and there's this case in New Jersey where a man uh, um, abused his wife, the 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 New Jersey judge initially said, you know what, um, if that's your belief in your Quran, that's okay then. We, we, he didn't, she wouldn't address it. Two I weeks later, that. it was overturned. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what the Oklahoma folks said they were trying to bring. The problem is when you put the word Sharia in there, there's a lot of my life that follows Sharia. Um, it has to do with my last will and testament, my marriage documents. A lot of that is Sharia, so you can't say you're going to outlaw Sharia. But you can say that you want the arbitration systems to have oversight. Right now, they have no oversight. The arbitration systems are locked tight. No judge can interfere in that, even if there's some concerns of things that violate law if both parties agree to it. And that's what these laws are trying to do. See, what worries me about this is I agree that it's good legislation uh, and I like the, the desired outcome, but I'm worried that it's going to come to, uh, to a head with some pretty serious judicial sentiment uh, uh, precedent in the form of... Uh, you know, mandatory arbitration clauses in existing contract law, right? So a lot of employment contracts have mandatory arbitration. A lot of end license users agreements have mandatory arbitration. Uh, do you think that uh, that that law that's where is it from? Michigan. Minnesota, Michigan? Michigan. Okay, I'm w woefully ignorant here, but <laughs> uh, uh, do you, do you predict that that could have any problem at a at a Supreme Court level? Is there is there a way to word this better? That uh, I'm worried that it's going to be no. You're right. There's legal. a clause at the end. One of the, it's two pages. The last paragraph talks about business agreements okay. that may be based on international law that are already uh, part of the system would not be affected by that because there are some businesses that do international corporate work, especially in today's age, uh, that were concerned about this. But the bottom line is they still can't sign an agreement with the Swedes or with Brits or with the Indian community, you know, Indian government or, or businesses without it also being kosher, uh, you know, right. with you American uh, law. Right. You can't yeah. overturn the exactly. Constitution. You know, one of the things that you brought up was was actually, uh, I guess, how, I guess, how, uh, I guess the Muslim community is, is kind of seen in, in, in England, right? And, and I guess the dealing with the integration of the Muslim community is in England, and I guess having, having this, this sort of separate court system. And it seems that there, there are a number of countries, especially European countries, that I don't know if they've really figured out how to integrate, uh, you know, integrate. I guess they're 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 new immigrants. I mean, we we see instead of instead of integration, we just see I guess a separation and I guess a uh, living beside each other. What what is it about I guess the U.S. that has allowed us to much more successfully integrate? Uh, you know, all of the I guess immigrant groups that come to the U.S. That's the f core belief in our organ why I formed our organization is that the American experiment has a unique element to it that is the solution to global radical Islam and Islamization that Europe does not have. Radical Islam has thrived in Europe because Europe has a secularism which is anti-religious. I mean, I went and helped the State Department in the Netherlands with a program on citizenship and democracy. And a lot of my, and I spoke to a number of Islamic schools there, and I spoke to the mayor of Amsterdam and some of the, the far right in the parliament there, and I talked to them. And one of the themes of, of my talk, as you'll see tonight, is about God and that America is under God. We share a certain moral construct. We come together to celebrate the, the, the liberation of people from any constructs that allow them to practice their own faith as they see fit, not based on one permutation of that faith. Europe does not have that. Europe, that discussion about God, I was told, Zudi, don't talk with that. You know, in Europe, they really don't like God talk too much. You know, we don't, it's a very secular society. And this is why people like Tariq Ramadan and other quasi-Islamists that pretend to be very moderate have been very effective in collectivizing Muslim communities to where you see neighborhoods in France where Muslims have not talked to a non-Muslim in months, where they are, uh, you saw police there where the riots were happening in the summer of 05 to where there were neighborhoods on fire that the police hadn't gone into in 10 years. So there's a, not only the segregation and the ghettoization of community, but the intellectual sense, and this is the, the answer to your question. 
I've talked to German Muslim scholars that are German that have come to this country now that are 70 years old that I used to read as a kid that have said, you know, I came to the United States because I was in Germany and I tried to modernize Muslim thought, but there are Muslim kids there that are in their fourth generation that still don't feel German and they'll never feel German. Right. While in America, he said it's an immigrant population, it's based on an immigrant ideology, based in individual rights that is based on an ideology. And that if you, my parents felt American within two hours of getting off the plane when they got here from Syria, because this country gave them freedom that Syria did not. The, the, the European nations are still stuck in sort of a land-based racial form of nationalism that is not based in an ideology. And one of the things I told the mayor of Amsterdam was when I went and talked to Dutch uh, uh, students, I, the, the first thing I'd ask the Muslim kids is, most of them from Algeria or Morocco, and I'd say, how many of you want to go back to Morocco where your parents immigrated from? None of them raised their hand. I said, so there's a reason you want to stay here. And I told the mayor, I said, you need to have them write essays about why they're staying here and have a huge movement of Muslims writing what they like about this country instead of just this anti-immigrant sort of mentality that feeds the gear wilders of the world and others that uh, have valid complaints about some things, but you don't prevent the takeover of multiculturalism in your society by just becoming xenophobic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, it's always struck me as such a, a myopic way to view the world. I mean, this, uh, this notion, okay, yeah, in Britain, you know, we don't really take God very seriously, so you really don't need to bring that up. Yeah, well, yeah except for guess who does take God really seriously? Uh, you know, Islamic people, Muslims. Exactly. And guess who takes it really seriously? Radical Muslims. That's the meaning of the word radical. That is what radical means. And so rather than, you, you know, taking these integrative approaches, uh, it strikes me that Pretty much every time I hear about a European government seriously trying to uh, deal with the uh, uh, the notion of uh, radical Islam or radical Muslim, uh, what I don't even know what the correct term is for it, but uh, uh, it seems like it always takes the same form, which is banning headscarves. Yeah. Which the idea is okay if we take away the uh, the uniform, they won't want to come here or they'll want to go home, which. Uh, in, yeah, in America, obviously, I don't think anybody would ever... Okay, I'll take that back. Few people would take that idea seriously because we have a certain notion that people are allowed to wear what they want to wear. Uh, do you think that... Okay, I guess we're just seeing the beginnings of those kinds of things uh, you know, starting to fail. You know, you know, Basically, young women being arrested and for wearing a, a, a certain kind of hat. Uh, do you think that there's been progress made in that realm? Do you think they're... They're starting to realize that that's not working. Do you think we're going to have to go through, you know, 15, 10 years of them banning this? Okay, that's, a, that's too many minarets. Okay, that, they can't wear this before they start to, you know, work on integration. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem that happens, and this is where you, you started, that we talked about the, the, the King hearings. A dysfunctional community, dysfunctional nations that cannot deal with the core issue will continue to have flashpoints of issues that are symptoms of the problem, but when they don't deal with I mean, Ground Zero Mosque controversy was a perfect example. I was going to ask you Here you had a a, a very controversial issue, and you had one group of Muslims that look at Ground Zero through the lens of Islam. Oh, here's our opportunity to evangelize and show people what Islam is. So they said, we have a right, versus other Muslims and other Americans that look at the look at Ground Zero through the lens of a being American and said, you know, maybe this is just not the right place to do this, even though you have a right to do it. And the hijab, et cetera. I mean, I have many of uh, the women in my family that wear a hijab, and uh, I, I would never want to see the government getting involved in that. Um, but at the end of the day, what's happened is the hijab itself has become a political instrument where many women actually wear it because of the political identity it right, gives them, yeah. not because of the religious conservative uh, identity that uh, or, or belief that they're wearing. So at the end of the day, this is where if we don't deal with the core issues, I mean, for example, it's not only the hijab, which is the head cover, but there's the outlawing of burqa. They've yeah. tried to outlaw that. Yeah. The niqab, okay. which I do think should be outlawed, is this facial covering. Huge debate in Britain. They uh, uh, tried to outlaw it. Um, and, you know, I think it should be because you don't have a freedom not to be identified when you're walking in public spaces. You know, your driver's license has your picture, a lot of things. And, you know, I think there's a security issue in not being able to identify. If people want to leave their house, they should at least be identifiable by their face. Yeah. Um, but these are all things that I think are dysfunctional 
representations of society trying to mix religious freedom issues with actually individual rights and, and what a pluralist society has on values that we share. You know, maybe the one plus side is that these women are able to go and actually commit acts of nonviolent civil disobedience to protest these laws rather than just, you know, Right. saying they have a problem with it. At least they, we can see the absurdity of charging somebody for, for, you know, and me not being Muslims, charging somebody for wearing a hat. I mean, who cares? Wear what you want to wear. The Park 51 thing is interesting, too. And uh, that was another thing I really got crushed on in, uh, in super liberal Iowa City because I think people should be able to build a religious building wherever they want. You know, if they, can, if they pay for it, they should be able to, uh, you know, own whatever land they want and do whatever they want with it. That being said, the stated goal of the Park 51 project was to make people feel more comfortable with Islam, uh, make people understand their Muslim neighbors and, uh, you know, integrate them better into the community. Okay, except for well over 50% of that community that they were trying to reach was super uncomfortable with that exact location. Uh, it's legal. It should absolutely stay legal. But if your goal is to foster this, you know, area of respect, didn't it strike you as maybe the right thing to do was to say, okay, Let's surrender to this point. We're still going to have a, a very nice uh, facility in Manhattan, you know, in the, the center, well, maybe what was once the capital of the world, uh, but maybe not in that, this exact place. Do you think there was a missed opportunity there for compromise? There really was. And I, I think what happened is, is you know, the messaging was terrible. Uh, these, uh, you know, the representatives they had for this thing were bad. I mean, there's a mosque closer yeah, I know. <laughs> than that thing. That nobody, and it's actually a more radical mosque. It's guys really? that stand on the street trying to convert people to Islam mm. that was completely destroyed and rebuilt. But it was a humble two floor, two story mosque that nobody really, they have a right to do that. What made this thing inappropriate was its scope, was, and its location, where it was from two blocks away, $150 million project, according to their founders. It was a statement, a message. Exactly, 14 floors. So on the one hand, they said, well, it's not all a mosque. On the other hand, well, which way do they want it? If it's not a mosque, then they should go through the same type of vetting as Walmart would go through, right? Yep. So if that's the issue, but on the one hand, they'd say, well, it's not a mosque, it's community center. But on the other hand, they'd wrap themselves around the First Amendment right. and say that it is a religious place. Well, if it is a religious place and it's $150 million, I want to know where that money's coming from, because as far as I know, I've tried to, I've helped build four mosques. We're right now in one of the more affluent places in Scottsdale, Arizona. $3 million project took us quite a bit of hard work to get that funded. So to think that I just know the Muslim community, and there's no structures, the most expensive structures in the $10, $15 million, and even those are funded from the Saudis. <laughs> and that concerns me, that the Saudis would then build something, or the Gulf states and the, and the group that was building this thing, where their funds, their foundations did have foreign money. Prince Talal had funded Imam Rauf's, one of his projects. So the issue is, is it's very important to me as an American if the Saudis, who had 15 of those hijackers, were building something a few blocks away from Ground Zero, because it sends a message on Al Jazeera and elsewhere that says, oh, look, we, you know, our radicals did this, and we still were able to build this uh, great mosque. I think it sent the wrong message. It was not the right place. Uh, if anything, as a community that has a lot of work to do internally, the last thing we need is this structure being built near Ground Zero. Yeah, it sounds like they essentially said uh, it's a mosque insofar as it makes it easier for us to build it. But it's not a mosque insofar there are any obstacles presented by that. And not to mention people that were against it were looked upon as being hateful and anti-Muslim. Oh, that's, you know a, that the that's latest what people poll, wrote me. Well, well, yeah. well, by the way, you were in the company of 74% of America. So I don't think 74% of America doesn't want mosques to be built and are xenophobic and anti-Muslim. Yeah. You know, I wanted to get back to integration, actually. And uh, um, one of the things, I guess, that you, you kind of hinted at, I guess, is you know, your your parents are from Syria. You know, you're a you're you're first generation. And I can relate to that. I'm first generation also. But I was I was wondering, I guess, how it is that you, I guess, balance, uh, you know, the, the culture of your parents and the culture that uh, you know you grew up in here in the U.S. Yeah, that's a great question. We were talking about that earlier, and it's um it's difficult because. You know, when uh, when I was younger, I remember my mom and dad uh, trying to make sure I had good Muslim values and I didn't drink and didn't, you know, wasn't promiscuous dating and all these kind of things. And, oh, you don't want to be like the Americans and do that. And, <laughs> you know, sort of the negative American culture was looked upon as this negative, you know, thing, even though they love this country, right? But it's almost like the only way they knew how to articulate what that culture was. And I would tell my mom, listen, you know, my Christian friends are actually a little more moral than some of my Muslim friends. <laughs> you know, so you, you want to be careful and generalizing. Um, so 
it, it really had more to do with morality and things like that. And, and, you know, one of the things with immigrants is you, you feel inevitably there's a, a sense of inferiority sometimes and sense of wanting to hold on to that. And I, I, I'm dealing with it with my own kids in that I want them to learn Arabic. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to lose their culture, their music, the poetry and the language, which I'm not as fluent in as my parents were, you know, so... It, I really want America to be a salad bowl and not a soup, right? Because the soup boils away all its con components and becomes one flavor, right? While a salad bowl sort of has this different parts and it doesn't lose its own. But yet there needs to be a common set of principles that we believe in, and that's what we're losing. I don't believe – I think multiculturalism is beginning to erode what America is all about. You can still hold on to who you are, and I think that's really what my – grandfathers and my my parents gifted me with was they told me about you know what what was important in my life and what values and this is really I have a book that's coming out in the spring about really how I turned out the way I did and it was really balancing what are the important things sort of the first things first in your life versus a false identification with things that just aren't that important so you know the part of the Arabic or Muslim culture that are tribal that don't disagree, don't expose things that should be fixed that we need to shed. But the parts of our community and our culture that are things we want to hold on to, we should keep and hold. Hey, what is your book called? Uh, it's <laughs> uh, Battle for the Soul of Islam. Okay, great. And that's coming out when? In April. I will certainly look for that at my local uh, book retailer. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned that you think that. Uh, multiculturalism, you put it, yeah. is uh, actually having a negative effect on uh, on this salad bowl quality of America that you'd like to preserve. I think a lot of people listening, especially here in Iowa City, said, well, that's the opposite of what multi multiculturalism is supposed to preserve the salad bowl. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and explain what you mean. Well, multiculturalism is where there's this sort of boogeyman out there of American guilt to where you don't want to hurt or offend anybody. So that lack of offense and that sense of wanting to always make sure that, you know, everything in the world is America's fault. And if anybody gets offended, that means we must have done something wrong. And that ultimately that becomes the litmus test by which you gauge whether we're doing what's right, you know, and, and all of a sudden the religion of the majority becomes offensive to where you can't even say Merry Christmas. You can't say things that are really truly part of people's faith. I mean, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin in Nina, and, and the fact that my friends could tell me, you know, I could tell them Merry Christmas was important to me. I, I sang in uh, Christmas carols, uh, even though I didn't believe all the words. Um, but uh, ultimately, I did that because then I could tell them, you know, it's Ramadan, you know, wish me a happy Ramadan, a blessed holiday, and I would never feel that uh, um, I was in any way looked down upon because of my religion or have to be embarrassed about it because if the majority loves their faith and feels proud about it, then I can. So multiculturalism is to where we have one culture that becomes the predominant culture to where no specific um, enclaves or, or specific beliefs can be lifted up. And that's what I think has happened with multiculturalism is it's watered everything down to where individuals can no longer lift up and be proud of who they are, especially majorities. Great. Wonderful. So our guest today was Dr. Jasir, uh, MD. I have, for, why did I write MD on there? That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, you can see <laughs> him in just yeah. a scant few hours. It's well-deserved, I'm sure. But you can see him in just a scant few hours, uh, 7 p.m. here in the South Room, 179 of the IMU. Again, admission is free, but first come, first serve. You can reach us at American Reason. That's American Reason at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.